In this video, I am going to explain about international regulation of the use of force in international law. So, we are going to learn about the concept and development of the use of force of international law. Second, United Charter and the prohibition the use of force. And third, the exception on use of force. The use of force also known as Juad Bellum means the conditions under which states may resort to war or to the use of armed force in general. The use of force is one of the principles of public international law. It contains the body of principles to ensure territorial sovereignty and independence of states, which are the main actors in international law. The Development of the Use of Force in International Law In the early centuries, the use of force has proved to be accepted, although the state need to face tragic consequences in resolving the disputes between states. After the First World War, the legal regulation of the use of force was made, in the form of the General Treaty for Renunciation of War as an instrument of national policy, more commonly referred to as the kellogg briand Pact. After the Second World War, the tragic events of this international conflict led to the adoption of the Charter of the United Nations, UN Charter, in 1945 resulting in the development of a framework, aimed at regulating the use of force by members of the international community. That system remains in force. Prohibition of the Use of Force Article 24 UN Charter states that, prohibits the threat or use of force and calls on all members to respect sovereignty, territorial integrity and political independence of other states. Article 24 was elaborated as a principle of international law in the 1970 Declaration on Principles of International Law. Principles of Article 24, 1. Wars of aggression constitute a crime against peace for which there is responsibility under international law. Second, states must not threaten or use force to violate existing international frontiers, including demarcation or armistice lines, or to solve international disputes. Thirdly, states are under a duty to refrain from acts of reprisal involving the use of force. Fourthly, States must not use force to deprive peoples of their right to self-determination and independence. Fifthly, states must refrain from organizing, instigation, assisting or participating in acts of civil strife or terrorist acts in another state and must not encourage the formation of armed bands for incursion into another state's territory. For example, the Nicaragua and USA case where it involved military and paramilitary activities carried out by the USA against Nicaragua from 1981 to 1984. Nicaragua asked the court to find out that these activities actually violated international law. Exception on use of force. Article 51 UN Charter states that nothing in the present charter shall impair the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations, until the Security Council has taken measures necessary to maintain international peace and security. The most prominent exception to the prohibition on the use of force is each state's right to defend itself. Article 51 reserves the inherent right of individual or collective self-defense if an armed attack occurs against a member of the United Nations. Unilateral self-defense The state finds itself in a condition of self-defense when it is confronted by an armed attack against it, in breach of international law. The forceful reaction of the victim to the unlawful use of force for its own protection apart from being itself a factual situation clearly justifies a necessity of being accommodated in the context of the law that prohibits, as a rule, the unilateral resort to force. International law has recognized this necessity by exonerating the defending state for its recourse to force and, thus, by investing its action with admissibility in law. This contingency can be explained by the fact that the law would have been indifferent to the concept of self-defense in the absence of the rule according to which its subjects would be under the obligation to refrain from the use of force. Collective self-defense 
the term of collective self-defense connotes the situation where a state which is not itself the victim of an armed attack resorts to force in defense of another state that has been the victim of an armed attack, and has requested the assisting state's military assistance for its defenses. Organizations such as NATO and Warsaw Pact were established specifically based upon the right of collective self-defense under Article 51. By such agreements, an attack upon one party is treated as an attack upon all, thus necessitating the conclusion that collective self-defense is something more than a collection of individual rights of self-defense. It is not up to the third states to decide the existence of armed attack between one state against another state. Only the victim's state can do such assessment. For example, the invasion of Kuwait by Iraq on August 2, 1990 raised the issue of collective self-defense in context of response of the states allied in the coalition to end the conquest and occupation. The Kuwait government in exile appealed for assistance from other states. Although the armed axio from January 16, 1991 was taken pursuant to United Nations Security Council resolutions, it is indeed arguable that the right to collective self-defense is also relevant in this context. Humanitarian Intervention Humanitarian intervention describes the threat or use of force by a state or a group of states, designed to compel a sovereign to respect fundamental human rights in the exercise of its sovereign powers. The sole objective of the intervention must be to either end or prevent human rights violations. With the ratification of the United Nations Charter, humanitarian intervention is only justified when there is a clear finding that humanitarian situation implicates international peace. The Indian intervention in Bangladesh, 1971, the Tanzanian action in Uganda, 1979, and the Vietnamese invasion of Cambodia, 1979, were all possible examples of humanitarian intervention but in all these three cases, the belligerents chose to justify their actions under the rubric of self-defense. In conclusion, the existing international regulations regarding the use of force should be properly interpreted and applied, sufficient with the current threats. Thank you.